God bless you. You may be seated. Let's turn together to God's Word to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. We are continuing in our sermon series on pillars of the faith. We've been looking at Old Testament heroes and some of the, the deep biblical and abiding principles that their lives just, they just pour out of them. And so we started with you know, Adam and Eve and, and Cain and Abel, and, and we've continued on with, with Noah and Abraham, Jacob, and uh, we find ourselves today with probably, uh, at least what you guys told me, you're one of your most favorite uh, uh, biblical heroes, and that's Joseph. In fact, a couple months ago, I asked the question, you know, hey, if you, you know, I, in, in, in the scripture, it talked about you know, looking to the prophets of old for their example. And I, I challenged you to, you know, hey, if you have a, a favorite biblical hero, to, uh, to let me know. And Joseph was the winner by far. In fact, by far, Joseph was the one that so many of you mentioned. And so I'm excited to share him with you today, knowing that for many of you, he's, he's pretty close to your heart. Now, there's a lot of reasons to, to really like Joseph, the coat of many colors Joseph from the Old Testament. I think one of the ones that comes out to me is he's such a Christ-like character. He's a person who is rejected by his own. But through that rejection and his suffering, he saves his people. And through that suffering is actually elevated to the highest place. He's very much a picture of Jesus. But at the same time, there's aspects of his character as a man that we look at and go, you know, I really admire that. And one of those that we're going to really highlight both this week and, and, and next week, Lord willing, is his never quit attitude, his perseverance. I mean, this is a man whose life did not take the trajectory that he would have ever expected. That he kept fighting, and he kept going, he kept serving, he kept loving, he kept giving his best in every circumstance and situations. And, and I, I hope today, as, as we ponder this matter of not giving up, that the Spirit would touch our hearts individually. You know, we, we each have our own journey, we each have our own story, we each have our own struggles. And there may be an area of your life right now you're pretty discouraged in. And my prayer is, is that today the Lord would encourage your spirit to not give up, to keep loving, to keep serving, to keep praying, to keep moving, to keep putting one step in front of the other. With that in mind, let's turn with our opening. We're going to pick up the scriptures somewhat as we go. Uh, the, the stories of Joseph span over 14 chapters. Um, we could do all that today, and then we could pick up next week, but uh, we'll just try to take it in parts as we go. So let's start out with Genesis 37, 1 to 11. We'll get started with Joseph's journey. Actually, we'll pick up in verse 2. It says, this is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers the sons of Bilhal, and, and the sons of Zilpal, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other, brother, other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gather around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, the brothers go out and they're doing the work of, 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 of shepherds. And as they're out with the flocks, Jacob sends Joseph out to, to, to check in on them. And of course, maybe you know this story well. 
his brothers see him coming. So look, take, pick up at the second part of, of uh, verse 17, and we'll go to 20. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But when they but they saw him but but they saw him in the distance and before he reached them they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, "Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams." Let's pray, Father. We thank you, Lord. It's all of us have unique things that you give us to encourage us, but yet, Lord, all of us also have unique things in our life that discourage us. We have an enemy at work that every time we try to take a stand for you, he, he works his schemes against us. We have a world that doesn't always appreciate, Lord, the, the work of the kingdom or you. And Lord, sometimes things don't go the way we expect or believe they should. And it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to want to quit. It's easy to want to pull back and not give you our best. Thank you for the example of Joseph today. And I pray that you'd speak through your spirit specifically to my heart and to the hearts of God's people here today. That Lord, we would keep our eyes on you. Keep striving to take hold of that for which you took hold of us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So I'll ask the question. I think most of us know the answer as I kind of open today with just kind of a word picture. What's the fastest land animal or fastest creature in God's creation that runs on the ground? The cheetah, right? The cheetah is an amazing animal. It can get, some believe it can get up to even 70 to 80 miles per hour. That's, that's, that's incredible. They can go from zero to 60 in about three seconds. That's unreal. So imagine you're getting on the on-ramp of 81, you see a tractor trailer, and you put the pedal down. And a cheetah could pass you standing still on the right. I mean, they are that fast. And it's incredible the burst and how they're built for that speed. But how long do you think they can sustain that? Not very long, Not very long brother. Amen. About 20 to 30 seconds at best. In fact, if a cheetah can't get its prey almost immediately after a burst, it has to quit. It's built. It's the classic sprinter. Now, let me ask you another question. What of God's creation that runs upon the ground can go the farthest? Man. Well, not me. But man. Man. In fact, there's an individual by the name of Dean, uh, his name's, let me make sure I get his name right, Dean um, Cornezes, Cornezes was his name, yeah, Dean Cornezes. He ran for 88 hours and 44 minutes, 350 miles in about 2005 through Northern California. He topped that a few years later by running 50 consecutive days, 50 miles each day. Now, obviously, that's not normal, but God did create human beings unique. We are weak as puppies compared to other creatures God has created. We are slow as molasses in January to most of God's creation. Yet, interestingly enough, he made us to go the distance. He made us to be the ones who can keep putting one foot in front of the other. He uniquely made us to be, in, to be that interesting, uniquely made, in God's image creator, creation that can endure. And boy, does God ask that of us, doesn't he? He asks us to endure. And when we look at the life of Joseph, he gives us such wonderful encouragement. He's a man in, in, in that, 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 that goes through it, doesn't he? Yet at each step, we see him fighting the good fight. And as we look at Joseph today, I'm actually going to start probably at my most controversial spot because I know there are many Joseph enthusiasts today, and I might throw a little shade on him at first. Now, there's a little bit of a debate over Joseph. 
And commentators and theologians, they say, study this text. They ask the question, is Joseph arrogant at the beginning of this text? Is he proud? He's 17 years old. How many 17-year-olds do you know that aren't a little bit full of themselves or have all the answers? How many 17-year-olds do you know that humility comes real easy? How many 17-year-olds do we know that, given the place that he was given in the family, that maybe it wouldn't go a little bit to his head? Or the dreams that he received wouldn't go a little bit to his head? Now, I know the Joseph apologists are going to say he was just speaking truth. All right? He was just speaking truth. He can't help it that it was his father treated him the way he did. I hear you. And the Scripture doesn't specifically condemn Joseph except for his father's rebuke. That's about the only thing you can say specifically in the Scripture. His father did rebuke him, but hey, it's Jacob. We don't know why he might rebuke his son. He's Jacob. He misses the mark too. But let's just entertain that for a moment. It's not hard to see that there could, there could be a part of Joseph that when he ends up in that pit, goes, oh my, I said too much. Now, not that there's any excuse for what his brothers did for him, to him, but there may be a part of this story where you could at least say that maybe how Joseph handled himself contributed to the resentment and anger of his brothers. Now, the Scripture doesn't specifically say that, but I think we can see that as an easy possibility here. There may be a very real moment when Joseph was pleading for his life in that pit where he might have been even saying sorry. You know, one of the hardest things to keep going in is when maybe we have been part of the problem. When we've not been perfect in a given instance or we've fallen short. One of the most difficult areas to say, Lord, I'm going to pick myself up. I'm going to dust myself off. I'm not going to quit is when we're part of the reason that it went sideways. And as I look at the life of Joseph, you know, maybe I'm going a little too far with that, but not with David. David sinned royally. I use that term literally. Royally he sinned. Yet there was life after his sin. Peter denied Jesus, yet was restored and had more than fruitful years ahead of him. Paul is the classic. In his zeal, he persecuted the church. Yet what does Paul say? How many of you know Philippians 3, 12 to 14 well? For some of you, it may even be a life verse. Not that I've already obtained all of this, or I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straighting towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now last Sunday when we were at the park, I talked about Jacob. And Jacob's that two-faced man in the sense that on one hand, he's this amazing object of grace. Yet at the same time, too, he's Lucy Ricardo. He's, he's Theodore Cleaver. He never gets away with anything. And I talked about how sin has real consequence. And I felt like in that moment, I needed to let that just stand for what it is. Sin is dangerous. It's not a joke. And we can carry consequences as a result of our sin. But brothers and sisters, there's also a new day in forgiveness in Christ. And when we do fall short, those are the very moments that instead of giving up, giving in, we need to run at Jesus all the harder. Amen. I love what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There, sin's not a joke, but there can be a new day. 
And one of the hardest things in life to do is maybe as a spouse, maybe as a father or a mother, maybe as a, 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 a servant in the kingdom, maybe just as, as, a, as a co-worker, maybe at, at whatever God has placed before you, we've dropped the ball. We've missed the mark. One of the most difficult but most needed areas of trust and faith is trusting the grace of God to give us victory even over our own struggles. This can be one of the toughest fights to keep fighting. It can be one of the toughest fights to keep fighting. But when we do sin, charging at Christ, seeking obedience, first with repentance, there can be a new day. The second aspect of Joseph's life is he is a man of broken dreams. Let's pick up his story. Let's take a look at verse 37, in chapter 37, verse 28, and then we're going to jump over to chapter 39 in a moment. Verse 28, so when the Midianite merchant came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver took him to Egypt. And so that's what happened to Joseph. But how did Joseph respond to that? Now go to chapter 39. Picks up the story of Joseph again. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted him to his care everything he owned. From the, t- from, that, from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessings of the Lord was on po- everything Potiphar had both in the house and in the field. So he left Joseph's, he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, do not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. What did his brothers, as they're seeing Joseph come? I read it just in the last section. What did his brothers say over him? They said this: come. Now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Joseph was a man who literally had his dreams broken, his literal dreams broken. God had given Joseph a dream twice. Later in the text, as Joseph is dealing with Pharaoh, it is stated that God gave Pharaoh the same dream twice to firmly establish it. Joseph has the same dream twice to firmly establish that God was going to raise him up among his family. And there would come a day where they would bow before him. Now imagine he's in the pit. Does that look like that dream? Does that look like what God told him? Is that the way you go to get to to being elevated? Then he's sold into slavery. What does that look like? Does that look like your dream being fulfilled? Does that look like God, you know, keeping his promise and and, and, and falling through with what you thought was going to happen? Furthermore, Joseph isn't just any child, is he? He's the great grandson of Abraham the grandson of Isaac and the son of Jacob who were promised and he was promised that be part of a great history that would affect the whole world and that would be given a land and a nation and descendants. And imagine as a young man the dreams he had about what God was going to do in and through his life and in and through his family and now he's gone. Now he's heading towards Egypt. Now it has been turned on its head. And maybe you've been in a moment in your life or many Or your dreams have been broken. Or at best to say things didn't go the way I thought is an understatement. Or even have thought that God laid something in your heart. And you say, Lord, this is not what I thought was going to happen. 
If you walk with the Lord long enough, you will know what that feels like. And sometimes one of the hardest areas of life to keep going in is when the dream turns or falls apart or things don't go the way we think they should. I think as human beings, we, we tend to think that life should be like steps, you know. Well, I start out here and then I go here and then here and then here and then here and then here and that's how life works. Or like a ladder, you know, Jacob had his ladder, right? Going up and going up and going up. What was Joseph's ladder like? Father, elevate you. Pit, slave, prisoner. Was that the plan? Is that going in the right direction? Is that how it's supposed to work? Well, then he goes to the palace and over his family. But the trajectory of his life was one wall, one barrier, one disappointment after another. And one of the realities of the life that we face is, is that sometimes our dreams are broken. Sometimes our expectations are thrown out the window. Sometimes even the things that maybe God has laid on our hearts don't go the way we expect. And one of the greatest challenges that we can face in our life is having faith in what we don't see. Our companion passage to our Old Testament heroes is Hebrews 11, the faith chapter that celebrates the heroes of the Old Testament. And it opens that chapter by giving the definition of faith. Faith is being certain of what we hope for and sure of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Brothers and sisters, certain of what we do not see. Sure of what we do not see. I tell you, brothers and sisters, there are moments when God asks us to surrender our dream for His. And there are moments when He lays something before our hearts and we think, okay, this is how it's going to unfold and He chooses to do it in a wildly different way. Or He's very, very patient in fulfilling His promises. And that can be hard. A lot of us, myself included, were built like cheetahs. Oh God, we get really excited and we burst out the gate. And the second we miss the gazelle, the second it turns a direction we didn't expect, we're out of breath, we give up, and we go home. But God made us to put one foot in front of the other, to trust Him to keep going. And right now, maybe you're in a position in your life where, Lord, this was not how it was supposed to be. This is not what I thought it was going to be. And one of the greatest acts of faith is to say, Lord, I trust you in what I don't see. But I'm certain of you. And I know you're good. And if you have a different dream for me, I'll keep going because I trust it's better than what I have in mind. Or if things don't go the way we expect, Lord, I trust you. If you're so patient with me, how can I not be patient with you? And know that God is good and keeps his promises. You know, what I love about Joseph is we find him in Potiphar's house, right? And what's he doing in Potter's house? Does he give up? Does he give in? I'm a slave. This isn't fair. fair. This isn't right. This isn't how it's supposed to go. No, the Lord's using him as a blessing. Because he's open to serve the Lord wherever God places him. Even if that's not his dream. We keep going. Amen. Now the final one we're going to touch on today is the lovely moment that Joseph comes face to face with Potiphar's wife. Can we keep going when we're even punished for doing what's right? Let's pick up in the second part of verse 6 there. Now jo Joseph was a well-built and handsome was well-built and handsome and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, "Come to bed with me." But he refused. 
With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owned has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her even or even be with her. Now what happens? She comes after him, doesn't she? And what does he do? He runs out of there like a scalded dog, doesn't he? But she gets a hold of an article of clothing. She gets a hold of his cloak. And what does she do? Instead of repenting, instead of realizing her sin, instead of, of joining Joseph in that moment of integrity, she slanders him, she attacks him, she lies and seeks him to be punished, even though he did what was right. And even though he had served his master faithfully, and even in that moment was going above the pale, imagine as a slave being owned by another man and still respecting him, still doing what he was told to do in the eyes of God. The resentment, it would have been easy to have. And every impulse and urge saying, go for it. Or even knowing the kind of woman she was and what would happen when he ran out the door. Of course, what happens next? Verse 19. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was in prison. The Lord was with him and showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who, who those held in prison, and he made him responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. What's the old adage? No good deed goes unpunished. No good deed goes unpunished. And brothers and sisters, there are times in our life where we're so excited to serve God and do what is good. We're so excited to make a stand in the Lord. And sometimes we get our nose bloodied for it. Sometimes we have to pay a price for it. And if we're living to please men, If we're living to please self, then it's easy to give up in those situations and say it's easier just to do what it takes to get by. But for Joseph, this text repeats again and again that his blessings come from God and he would not sin against God. You know, we're in a spiritual battle. We do not live in the land of gumdrops and sugar plums. And although man may war against man, there is a greater, greater battle than that is, that is happening all around us all the time. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've taken a stand to stand with the kingdom of God. And there is an enemy who will oppose you. Who will see to it through his schemes, that will throw the kitchen sink at you when you stand for the Lord. I tell you, in ministry, when you know God is at work, there's a part of you that goes, we'll pay a price for this. And that's okay. Even going into the week of Bible school, if you talk to the directors, they knew God was going to do something great in that week because it was so hard. And I tell you, any time you take a step towards the kingdom of God, there will be people who will slander you. There will be people who will throw you under the bus. There will be circumstances that come up in your life that you will pay a price. And it's very easy in our culture that says, okay, it's easier to just disappear in the crowd 
It's easier just to take care of self, to just walk on the edge of morality, to walk on the border between the kingdom of God and the world than it is to fully stand with Christ. Because you know if you stand with Christ, you're going to be a target. Jesus said that they persecuted him and he was perfect. What do you think they're going to do to us? They had no ammunition against Jesus, yet they still fired volleys. What about us who they do have ammunition on? And we have a world that if, if we live to please them, we will not please God. But if we live to please God, we will not please them. heard an analogy from uh, Tony Evans, Pastor Tony Evans. He picked the football teams. I wouldn't have picked these teams, but he, he used a football analogy. He said, imagine the Indianapolis Colts go in at halftime and they begin to complain to their coach, coach, it's not fair. We're trying to do our best out there. We're trying to score touchdowns on every play. We're trying to make crisp passes, sharp reads. We're trying to do our best. But every time we do, the Chicago Bears, they hit us. They swat the ball away. They knock us down. What do you think the coach would say? Suck it up, buttercup. That's the game. We're going to face opposition. And I tell you, the more serious our body gets about the Lord, the more we may face. And our world is not becoming less hostile. It's becoming more to the things of God. But you know what? That's okay. Because our reward's not from them. Our protection's not from them. Our vengeance is not from them. For them. And our battle's not against them. This is what the Scripture says our battle is. Finally, in Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you, can, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. We're called to stand. And the world won't reward us, and the enemy will scheme against us, Brothers and sisters, isn't the blessing of the Lord sweet? For Joseph, certainly the world did not bless him for doing what was right, but the Lord did, and that was enough. And that was enough. I don't know how these three scenarios hit you today. We're going to come back next week, Lord willing, and, and, and dive into a few more and then look at how Joseph's, uh, how, what were some things Joseph did that helped him keep going? to not give up. So we're going to pick this up next week. But there's, I believe, a movement of God's Spirit in my soul, and I believe in yours, that there may be some areas of our lives where we're tempted right now to want to give up. Maybe in some relationships. Maybe in the calling God has laid upon our lives. Maybe in ministry. Maybe in a million things I can't begin to describe. But I pray today the Lord has been speaking to your heart, saying, Keep fighting, keep serving, keep loving, keep praying, keep seeking me. Don't give up. There's a verse that the Lord has given me this year, and I wish it wasn't this verse, but it's been meaningful, and I share it with you. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Brothers and sisters, do not give up. Keep serving, keep loving, keep praying, keep giving your best to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. There are moments in our lives where, hey, we get discouraged. You know that. I mean, even men like, Lord, I look at men like Elijah who laid under the broom tree and said, Lord, I, I, I just want to die over the words of, 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 of a wicked person. He said, I'm ready to give up. Lord, thank you that in you we can keep running the race. And in your power and strength, you can revive us as you did. Elijah, you came and touched him. And you came and nourished him through the angel. Not once, but twice as he needed it. 
There's life after our failures if we, if we trust and obey and we turn to you in repentance. There is, there is life after dreams being broken and maybe better dreams and better ways and better promises that, that Lord, we know your ways are better than ours. We dedicate ourselves to just trusting you in that way, Lord. There are moments when it's hard to do what's right. But Lord, may we take sweet blessing from you. Lord, I don't know how you're speaking to the hearts of your people today. I know you're speaking probably very individually to some people. Encourage them right now. Lift them up right now. Put fresh wind and fresh fire in them right now. That they can be what you've called them to be right where you've placed them. That's exactly the model of Joseph, Lord. Wherever you placed him, he was faithful. Lord, wherever you place us, Lord, give us the courage and the power of your spirit. Be faithful. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we close. We're going to sing together. Trust and